Well, thank you all for coming. It's, it's wonderful to have such a very good audience uh, today. My name is Stan Katz. I'm a professor here at the uh, Woodrow Wilson School. And I want to apologize. I'm getting over a cold, and my voice is probably not very good, but I'm not going to be up here uh, for very long. Um, today, um, as you know, we're here to uh, have a panel in conjunction with, as we frequently do, with a splendid uh, exhibition we have uh, downstairs on guns in America. Uh, immediately following this at 6 o'clock, there's going to be a reception downstairs in the Bernstein Gallery. So you'll be able to uh, talk to one another uh, and to look at the uh, images, which are from this book, which we'll, we will have a copy down there for you to look at by Kyle Cassidy. And I want to acknowledge Kyle right now, who's sitting in the middle of the audience right there. The, the, the images are really just wonderful. So please do look at them carefully when you go uh, downstairs. Uh, the, uh, the show was curated, as our shows always are, by Kate Summers, who is the curator of the Bernstein Gallery. I want to thank Kate right now for that, too. She is sitting right up there. It's an important part, by the way, of our program here because when we put on shows, uh, they almost always have a public policy um, hook uh, to them because we intend the art to work with our program here. And we offer a degree, graduate and undergraduate degrees, in public policy. The noise you hear outside is the undergraduates. The seniors have turned in their theses today. And the tradition here, one doesn't know how far back it goes, you know, to the Middle Ages, maybe 20, <laughs> 25 years ago. Um, they jump in the pool after they turn in the theses, and then we give them hot chocolate and hope that they don't get sick, but probably not. So the, the topic uh, is guns in America, uh, and that's a um, difficult top topic to talk about in this country, and I think one of the virtues of the images uh, is the way in which Kyle has portrayed uh, ordinary Americans in their homes with their weapons. Uh, and uh, I would <clears throat> encourage you, by the way, to get the book um, because what accompanies the photographs, and you'll see some examples on the walls downstairs, are some wonderfully selected texts that Kyle has developed in interviews <clears throat> excuse me, with the people who actually own these guns. So you get not only the image, but uh, statements by them of um, in answer to the question, why do you own guns? So uh, we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, in framing this, I simply thought it would be useful to present on a panel a, a range of views on guns in America, and that's what we've done. There isn't a program to this. We haven't discussed the subject um, amongst ourselves. I assume we don't uh, probably agree on large parts of it. I'm quite sure we don't agree on uh, parts of it, but I think uh, several points of view will be uh, expressed, and that is the, the idea. Um, I'm going to resist the um, temptation to make a speech myself, but I did want to say that you know, if you like to read on this subject, there's a lot uh, to read, and I, I happen to have here just, this is stuff that came into my office in the last month since I, we um, decided to uh, publicize this show. This is a copy of a now famous or infamous book, probably, called um, Arming America, the Origins of a National Gun Culture, uh, which came out now about 10 years ago, I guess. It caused a lot of controversy because it turned out that there is some question about the statistics used um, in the book. And what's particularly interesting about that is that it refers back to this, the Constitution of the United States, because as everybody here will know, much of the discussion about guns in America relates to the existence or non-existence of a right to guns in America. And that, of course, flows from the text of the Second Amendment, which I'm not going to read to you because I'm sure you all uh, know it. Uh, but we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of hundred years arguing about uh, what the uh, framers, or at least those who passed the uh, Bill of Rights in 1791 uh, had in mind when they framed that enigmatic and grammatically imperfect uh, amendment to the Constitution. Grammar has never caused us more trouble than in the, uh, in the Second Amendment. I think Peter Brooks may have something to say about that. 
but of course also as a contemporary issue, and here I gathered a lot of material, but I'm really not going to use it, um, I entered into the Google search engine the word gunman uh, and came up with a page that had, there were 10 items on the first list, and five of them were uh, shootings, uh, in I think every case, uh, killings of more, uh, two or more individuals, sometimes many more, uh, by gunmen of various sorts. And uh, that, of course, is part of the issue. Uh, we all know the slogan, uh, guns don't kill, people kill. Both things are true, of course. Uh, and the question is what the relationship is between those two uh, notions. We will certainly uh, talk about that. There isn't a tougher domestic issue, I think, in the United States. Uh, and it's one that is almost certain to increase in saliency <coughs> in coming months and years. So it's it's a particularly important subject for us to grapple with. So I'm going to introduce all three speakers at once, um, and I'll do that quite briefly. Uh, and then they'll each speak, and they're going to speak for about 15 minutes each, and I hope that will leave us some time for uh, discussion, but then we can continue the conversation uh, downstairs afterwards. I think we have a particularly uh, distinguished and interesting panel for you uh, today. Uh, the lead-off speaker is going to be Professor Nicholas Johnson from the uh, law school at Fordham University uh, in New York. Uh, he has a range of legal specialties in the, in the teaching programs there, but he has long uh, had an interest in uh, the Second Amendment and to, in the issue of guns uh, in America. Uh, just to give you an idea of some recent publications of his, uh, he has an article uh, just a couple of years ago called Self-Defense, question uh, mark. Another one, uh, a second amend <clears throat> sorry, amendment moment, the constitutional politics of gun rights. Uh, another one, uh, testing the, second, the state's rights, second amendment for content, a showdown between federal environmental closure of firing ranges and protective state legislation earlier. He had a piece on the intersection of abortion and gun rights, which is a fascinating um, idea. And uh, earlier than that, uh, beyond the Second Amendment, an individual right to arms viewed through the Ninth Amendment, which is another interesting twist on the problem. So he is obviously somebody who's devoted a lot of thought uh, to this. And I'm particularly pleased that he was able to join us today. It's the first time we've had a chance to meet, and I'm, I'm delighted to be able to meet him. The second speaker, on the other hand, is someone I've known for a long time. It's Professor James Jacobs from New York University Law School, where he is the Chief Justice Warren E. Berger, Professor of Constitutional Law and the Courts. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to ask him whether um, Warren E. Berger and Constitutional Law are not an oxymoron, but maybe we can talk about that later. He's the Director of the Center for Research in Crime and Justice at NYU uh, Law School. And he is somebody who has worked in this field for a very long time. Uh, Professor Johnson is trained in law, uh, as of course Professor Jacobs is, but he's also a PhD sociologist. Um, he did both of his graduate uh, degrees at the University of uh, Chicago, and he's been a leading figure in both of those fields. And uh, uh, guns and weapons have been one aspect of what he has been interested in. His most recent book, actually, is called Mobsters, Union, and Feds, The Mafia and the American Labor Movement, which is a quite wonderful book, which I recommend to you, but it's not on this subject. Uh, but in 2002, he published an important book called Can Gun Control Work? Um, he also has written books earlier on uh, New York City and organized crime, which is another interest of his, and an earlier one on hate crime. Uh, so Jim is someone who's worked both, by the way, on the, the legal conceptual side of this and the empirical side, which I think will come into the discussion. And the third speaker is, is another uh, longtime uh, friend of mine, Peter Brooks, who uh, is now here with us at Princeton as a visiting Mellon professor, uh, and he's connected to comparative literature and our University Center for Human Values. And he's particularly running a project that is in uh, a related field, that is the field of law and humanities. He's running a project on law and interpretation, on translation, uh, and is a very distinguished literary specialist 
who has, over the past decade or more, taken a serious interest in law from the perspective of someone who works with uh, literary uh, texts. Uh, he's written uh, more books than I could uh, tell you about in a short period of time. But he's, and he's attempted in particular to adapt the techniques of narratology uh, to understanding judicial opinions and to understanding the way law itself uh, works. He has visited a number of universities and law schools and was for many years the Sterling Professor of Literature at Yale University where he was also associated with the law school uh, there. It is, by the way, a great boon for Princeton to be able to have Peter here at this stage of his career. So it's a really distinguished panel. I'm not going to get out of the way and ask and Professor Johnson to start. And we'll simply proceed with their presentations and then move on to questions. Thank you, Stanley. Welcome. Um, I expect my primary val value on the, the panel today is I may be the only person here in the room who's home state university mascot carries a functioning firearm and discharges it during high points of sporting events. Um, growing up in West Virginia, I literally did not know anyone who did not own guns. Um, and today when I go to New York where I teach, uh, it's almost the opposite. At least I can't get anyone to admit that they do. Um, and ultimately, I expect that that says something about the arguments I'm willing to entertain, maybe something about the views that I'm going to express, although I think I probably will raise questions more so than express views. But it seems to me that, that culture, uh, the environment in which we, or from which we view and approach the gun issue, predicts a great deal about the views and arguments that we are willing to credit. Um, they will perhaps have an impact on uh, what I suggest tonight. Uh, but m my goals are modest. I'm, I'm going to do two things. First, uh, very quickly, I'm going to try and suggest a number of things that there is no real disagreement about, um, just the context in which we approach the problem. And then I will talk in a little more detail, um, maybe a secondary way, about things that there is broad disagreement about why they are divisive, uh, how they limit our practical and, and political options in terms of violence policy, uh, and how they generally fuel the debate uh, about firearms in America. Uh, first, we talked a bit about, Stanley mentioned the Second Amendment. Uh, that's going to be secondary. Maybe I won't mention it at all other than uh, just by um, illusion. There are, notwithstanding the Second Amendment, though, 44 state constitutions that have their own separate uh, constitutional right to arms provisions. Uh, and these are not antiquated provisions. The last one was Wisconsin in 1987, and a number of the others uh, have occurred either uh, newly or were renewed within the last 50 years. Additionally, 40 states have what is called shall issue concealed carry, which means that people who wish to carry firearms concealed in those states um, are not subject to the discretionary uh, decision making of the sheriff or someone, uh, but if they are competent to own the firearm, then they go through a separate process and they're allowed to carry the firearm. Uh, that's happened essentially in the last uh, 20 years, just a, quite a dramatic shift. Um, gun deaths in America uh, range between 28,000 and 30,000 a year. About 60% of those are suicides. So the gun homicide rate that we focus on when we think about the shootings, et cetera, that, that uh, are so tragically in the news, that number is around 13,000, 14,000 uh, per year. Most of that crime, most of that gun crime, is handgun. And recently in the decision, uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court declared unequivocally that handguns were explicitly constitutionally protected, um, the Second Amendment debate that you were mentioning. Also, we know pretty much for sure, and this is a, a tougher one, people will, will quibble around the edges, that the civilian gun inventory in the United States approaches about 300 million firearms. There are guns in between 40 and 50 percent of American households, depending on whose numbers you look at and credit. Americans own nearly half the private firearms in the world. 
And each year, we buy half of the new private firearms in the world. Now, that increase is not terribly significant in terms of the overall number. It's about 1 percent uh, increase in new firearms per year, again, depending on whose numbers you, you, you look at. Um, about 500,000 firearms are stolen in the United States each year. And internationally, we know from surveys done by uh, the International Firearms Survey in, in Switzerland, uh, in Geneva, that the defiance ratio, sort of my term, but it's their data, the defiance ratio in places where a confiscation of firearms and re a registration of firearms has been attempted is about 2.6 illegal guns for every legal one. So this notion uh, or this, this tendency or impulse to defy firearms restrictions is something that we observe internationally and it's quite widespread. The places that give us this two points, this uh, ratio though, are places that have nothing near the sort of robust gun culture that we have in the United States. So this is the context for our conversation and what I plan to do now is uh, given um, well within the boundaries of, of the time that I have, uh, to talk about some of the more interesting parts of this conversation that, that divide us. Perhaps the, the core question that we're divided on uh, is, is this dispute about the costs and the benefits of, of firearms. And we're, we're certainly at odds on the question of firearms utility in terms of our perception a reaction to events of the type that Stanley was, was talking about in the introduction. That is, we've had in the, in the last couple of weeks you know, horrific shootings in, in Binghamton, New York, and in uh, Pittsburgh. And one obvious visceral reaction is revulsion against the gun, and also potentially against gun owners or gun advocates, to raise the question, you know, why would they, and that's a shifting target, but why would they block these laws that would stop this nonsense is one reaction that uh, uh, I often get from my, my colleagues. Um, a competing response comes from people who ask, well, is there a counterpoint that reflects our instincts that guns have some real utility? Um, and it's actually out there. It comes through less forcefully in the national media, but in the age of the internet, it's easy to find. For example, uh, there's, there's uh, a site run by a, a acquaintance of mine. Uh, it's called Clayton Kramer's Civilian Self-Defense Blog. Um, what he does is to scan the news for local reporting, instances of self-defense, mostly instances <coughs> where I think if we all pushed, we'd say, yeah, I guess that was a good result. We're not happy about it. It was tragic. Someone had to do something horrible. But the person who should have survived is the one who did. Um, Kramer chronicles these on the view that they don't make it into the national press. And this possibility that there is a counterpoint out there, I think, is one of the sources of our disagreement. Now, it's important for me to clarify here that I'm not trying to suggest that the gun is a magic talisman. I'm not trying to suggest that people who own guns have some sort of guarantee uh, that they're always going to be safe. Um, I'm only suggesting that it is one variable in the threat dynamic, only one. But it is an important variable, and it's one that the armed individual controls, or at least thinks that he does. And in terms of policy, that is maybe the same thing. I think that people who reason this way might conclude that they are better off with their firearm. And people who are open to that possibility that they are better off with the firearm will react to episodes like what we saw in Binghamton and others in a different way. Instead of revulsion, they may be drawn to the gun and they may view calls for at least indiscriminate restrictions on firearms as a threat to their own safety. And I'm not going to suggest to you who's got the better of this argument, but it seems to me important to realize that there are just fundamental disagreements about this question. The source of those we can talk about uh, a little later. Uh, I've talked about the sort of visceral sort of social response uh, in this context. There's disagreement empirically in theory as well, about the utility of firearms. Uh, the, the primary uh, impulse for lots or most of our modern 
suggestions about supply regulation come from something called the Zemring hypothesis. Franklin Zemring in the 1960s uh, basically did studies uh, comparing the U.S. gun rate to countries that had more restrictive gun laws. And what he found was, hey, it looks like the people who have fewer guns have uh, less gun crime. And it's an appealing idea. I mean, it conforms to our, our intuitions. We're all sitting in this room. Presumably no one is armed. The likelihood there's going to be firearms crime in this room is very low. And if we could guarantee that no one here was armed, then we would say it's, it is zero. And if you project that idea to the, so the societal level, what you end up with is the idea that less, that fewer guns uh, mean less crime. Uh, the problem is, in the context of the U.S. environment, we are far beyond the point where we can get to that zero level of inventory, which on which the uh, uh, the Zimmering hypothesis uh, depends. Uh, on the other side of the Zimmering hypothesis, you've got uh, work from people like Gary Kleck, who argues that there are two and a half million defensive gun uses per year. Things that some people would suggest are beneficial socially. Uh, John Lott, the much maligned John Lott, uh, argued that more guns equals less crime. Uh, he's done an econometric study suggesting that places where there is liberal concealed carry have uh, uh, less crime overall. Uh, he's very precise and, and has been criticized uh, widely for a variety of different things. Uh, it seems to me that that's actually the substitute war. Uh, what typically occurs in the context of the conversation about concealed carry is that initially there are claims that are grounded on the Zimmering hypothesis. They are essentially claims that there will be blood in the streets. If you allow ordinary people to walk around with guns on their hips concealed, then um, you know, somebody bumps into somebody at the Walmart and, and suddenly you've got a shooting. That has turned out not to be the case over and over and over again. We've got, uh, and now we've got 40 different experiments in the, uh, uh, the states that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can talk in more detail in a bit uh, about uh, concealed carry. I mentioned that we were divided culturally, and I just want to elaborate on it. Over the past few months, I've, I've traveled to Texas and Colorado and Washington, D.C. and San Francisco and back home to West Virginia, and thinking about firearms in America, the role of firearms in American firearms regulation, one gets it's very different views on the question depending on where you're sitting. And it is, it seems to me, undeniable that we've got a different sense of what works, of what is necessary, and a different sense of the, the costs and, and benefits, the utility of firearms, depending on where one is sitting. Uh, Bruce Briggs uh, has, has talked about this rural-urban divide in some detail. And indeed, Justice Breyer, in his dissent in the Heller case that I mentioned earlier, uh, speaks in, in some detail about the difference between the gun problem in rural environments. Some people have suggested that this is an illusion to race, uh, but rural and, sorry, urban environments versus rural environments. And you know, people suggested that the, uh, the allusion to the, the urban gun problem is really a uh, uh, reference to the problem of young black males in urban areas. Um, okay. There's another thing that divides us, and, and, and it reaches more broadly, and that is we're divided in terms of our views about the role of government in our country. Um, and I'm not talking about red state, blue state particularly, but I, I, I am going to suggest that this question implicates our willingness to trust government. And it implicates the sub-issue of whether it is, it is wise for us to trust government. And when I say us, I'm actually uh, suggesting or implying that there is some division in terms of the identity of the, the, the subject. Um, for outsiders, for political minorities, the idea of fully trusting government to provide something that is extraordinarily important, personal security, it's tough. It's, it, it's, asking, it's asking a lot. Um, and, and it also raises a point of irony, because it seems to me that, that lots of people who would never suggest that it was appropriate to trust government to provide exclusively for things that were uh, higher or lower, depending on what you think about it, on, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you think that, that security is the baseline um, and, and other things like education, well, would you trust the government to decide exactly how your kids were going to be educated or precisely uh, when you were going to eat? It's absurd. 
But the idea is, is appealing to lots of people in the context of the, the more basic question of whether we should trust government, whether it is wise to trust government exclusively, to handle what we recognize are the, basic, are the primary tools uh, for uh, providing personal security. Uh, for many people, that idea, probably some of the people in this book, that idea, trusting government for or fully for personal security, is absurd. Um, the visceral piece that I sort of alluded to before, that is people react viscerally to this issue. Um, viewing this book, you, I, I was looking at the, the photos and, and, and they're entertaining. Um, primarily, I think, because of the, the, the folks who were involved. But years ago, we were involved in, in the legal academy in a debate about the Second Amendment, and, and I was a member of, I am a member of a group called Academics for the Second Amendment, which is more about, uh, depending on who you talk to, more about sort of honest interpretation of, and, and, and serious, or taking rights seriously, an honest interpretation of constitutional texts, and using the same standards, et cetera, uh, for, for one provision as you would use for others. But w w on the other side of, of the equation was, was another group that I guess is, is sort of disbanded, but they, they ran an advertisement in the American Lawyer, and the advertisement, I wish I had it, but it showed a very ugly, scary looking gun called the Tech 9, uh, and it had under the, the uh, as a caption, does the Second Amendment mean that we must tolerate this? And it was self, it was a powerful image, it was self-explanatory, but and, and what it hooked into was the idea that people do come at this question in a, a visceral way, that is, we react to the image of the gun in sort of the ways that I tried to, to describe uh, earlier. And, and this, this critique this, that we react this way. It's been around for a long time. Some people said, well, this is a question of religion uh, that, we're, that, is, uh, that we're not really thinking about. Um, something new has happened over the last few years. Uh, cognitive psychologists are now suggesting uh, better explanations for long-standing visceral reaction type uh, critiques, uh, suggesting that certain things come to us from our reptile brain, uh, certain ancient things. Um, I don't know that this is one of them. I haven't read enough of the cognitive psychology and, uh, to, to, to appreciate it, although uh, um, the latest book, This Is Your Brain on Music, is a wonderful exploration of, of, of the idea, and it, it prompted me to, to, to think about this. Um, it prompted me also to, to worry and, and to, I guess, advance a, a, a caution. That is, I think we need to be self-conscious about how we come to our views on this question. Um, I think there's a possibility that we come to our views not by thinking them through, but by feeling them. And I think it's absolutely natural. I think it is our, uh, what is it, the cerebellum or the cerebrum, one of those things, whatever the, I wrote it down, it's the cerebellum. Um, are we thinking it or are we feeling it? And the, the possibility that we feel our way into this more than we think our way uh, into this, I think just ha is important for us to appreciate as we're working our way through this debate. The reason I think that is that after Heller, post-Heller, where the Supreme Court, I think, as, as we all know, uh, has, has confirmed uh, what people like me have been saying for a long time, that whether, like it or not, this really is a very powerful case for an individual right, now that the court has said that, we've got a lot of questions that we've got to resolve, and we can't simply resolve them utilizing techniques like holding up an ugly gun and saying that creeps me out and therefore we have to ban it. We actually have to think about things like ballistics. We actually have to think about creepy things of the type that the court engages you mentioned earlier, in the abortion context. Are there differences between different sorts of technologies? What sorts of methodologies in terms of violence policy make sense? And what sorts of uh, measures are really just symbolic or worse, pandering? So as we proceed, and we can have, uh, I, I hope, a, a, a conversation further about it in the, the Q&A, uh, there, there are possibilities that make sense in terms of what to do in terms of violence policy. There are things that are just silly, at least in my view. But evaluating those questions means that you actually have to take seriously the distinctions between firearms. You actually have to engage the idea in the frontal lobes as opposed to simply recoiling and saying that's a horrible thing and people who uh, are, are interested in it are horrible folks.
Well, thank you for having me for this, uh, this nice event. Um, I've given a lot of thought to this subject. It's, it's really one of the most uh, interesting that I've worked on in my career as a criminologist and criminal law professor. Um, I just, I, I, I'll try to be brief. First, uh, say a few things about what is the problem uh, for which gun control might be the solution. And I think it's helpful to think about four possible problems. Uh, one is accidents with guns. Uh, that's a s particular kind of problem. It's not a huge problem in terms of casualties in the U.S. We have far fewer um, fatal accidents with firearms than we do uh, with swimming pools, for example, and it has not increased over uh, the 20th century, but we could talk about the misuse of firearms uh, and, and accidental deaths at home and in hunting. Uh, we could talk about suicide, which uh, is, uh, claims the largest number of casualties uh, from firearms, and we could ask ourselves, uh, do we think that uh, suicide is a gun problem in the United States and that a way to address suicide is by somehow uh, addressing the availability of firearms. Uh, I, 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 I don't think that's very plausible, uh, although we have a lot of firearms in the United States, uh, we do not have a very high suicide rate. Our suicide rate is just about average uh, or a little below average for developed countries, so it doesn't look like the huge firearm stock that we have in the United States has created a suicide explosion. Uh, there's the violent crime uh, problem, and we do have a lot of violent crime in the United States, but violent crime is a, is a complicated issue. Uh, it's very much concentrated in our cities and uh, uh, among our, our, uh, our uh, uh, underclass and it, a lot of it surrounds uh, drugs and a lot of it is committed by people with extensive criminal records uh, and we have a lot of violence without guns as well for most of the people the vast majority who commit crimes with guns it is illegal for them to possess a gun uh, as you may know uh, a person who's ever convicted of a felony in the United States may never for the rest of their life legally possess a gun on pain of a, of a maximum 10-year sentence, federal sentence, and also uh, state sentences. And then the fourth problem uh, is that of these mass killings uh, uh, that get so much attention, and, and rightly so, because of the, the, the tragedy of such massacres. Uh, even though they, uh, uh, they get so much attention, they are extremely rare. Um, any given community probably would, has experienced zero, right, over the last century. Probably none has experienced more than one. Uh, they're not connected in any way, uh, and they're very much interconnected with uh, problems of mental health and people going off berserk. Uh, and of course, they could also be committed without firearms, as, as, we, as we learned so sadly in Oklahoma City, uh, which was a massive massacre, which involved explosives, and of course the 9-11 attack, which involved box, uh, box cutters. But I want to assume uh, for a moment that there is a problem, that we do have a gun problem, or maybe more than one problem, the, the policy question is what could be done about it? Uh, sometimes the, the, the debate uh, uh, proceeds as if there is a package of solutions out there on the shelf, and all that needs to be done is to take it off the shelf, for God's sakes, and put it in, implement it, and put it into practice. Uh, and in my work, uh, I've, I've tried to 
go go through that in great detail as to what do you, what is meant by gun control. I mean, what are the options given where we are now as a society with 300 million firearms in civilian hands? What are the options? And I would I start by saying that prohibition is not an option. There is no no gun option for the United States of America. There is no prohibition option. Uh, we've had experience with prohibition. We had a nice look at it between 1919 and 1933 with alcohol. Uh, we've had another nice look at it over the last uh, 30 years with, with uh, certain mood and mind-altering drugs. We've thrown uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of people into our state and federal prisons for drug crimes. We've devoted billions and billions of dollars to suppress the trafficking in drugs and the possession of drugs and the taking of drugs, and yet uh, the drugs are still uh, very much available and very much used. Um, uh, the idea of, of of some kind of gun prohibition is, is just is just a, a fantasy. Uh, 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 guns are so much more prevalent than drugs, and they have such a stronger place in our culture and in our society, politically and socially and numerically, uh, that the the idea that you could launch a war on firearms. Uh, it is just should be taken off the table completely. It's not possible. It's not conceivable. It would never happen. It couldn't be done. Um, it couldn't be enforced. Uh, just go back and think a little bit about alcohol prohibition and think about the, uh, the drug war. So what can be done? Well, where we have a strong consensus in the US, uh, uh, overwhelming consensus is that anybody who commits a crime with a gun uh, should go to uh, should be punished uh, and go to jail. There's hardly any dissenters from that. Uh, we do send a lot of gun criminals to jail. Uh, that seems to make sense because a lot of the people who commit violent crimes already have records, and uh, there I think. I think that is going to be the basis of our gun control policy is in better enforcement, a better apprehension, uh, uh, better prosecutions, better targeted prosecutions, and better sentences and longer sentences. I think that's about the best we can do. Yeah, we have other policies like you can't have a machine gun. Uh, you, that uh, was a policy laid down in the 1930s, and there is no civilian market in machine guns. We have the Brady Law, which, which purports to, to uh, regulate the, the, the uh, retail market in guns so that there's a background check so that guns don't fall into unreliable hands, that is, hands uh, of people who have ever been convicted of a felony or people who have been civilly committed uh, to, uh, to a mental hospital. Uh, I don't think the Brady Law is very effective because it only regulates the retail market. It doesn't regulate the secondary market. So somebody could stand outside a, a gun store and say, oh, uh, I see you just bought a gun. Uh, what kind did you get? And maybe uh, I'd like to have that gun. I don't want to bother going in here. I'll just pay you uh, $50 more, and you could, you could sell it to me, or you could put an ad in the paper, or so forth. And you might then ask, well, couldn't we regulate the secondary market of, of guns? It would be extremely difficult, extremely difficult to regulate private sales between people. Plus, we have a black market in guns, which is the way that criminals get their guns anyway. When they interview criminals in prison, they ask them, how did you get your gun? They didn't go to the gun store. They got it on the street from the same people that are dealing drugs um, uh, in, their, in their neighborhoods, or they borrowed it from a fellow gang member or something like that. So there's already a black market. and. And there's always the problems of black, of, uh, of black markets. 
Some people talk about trigger locks. They said, you know, trigger locks, there's a gun control, you know, uh, program that everybody can agree on. You're going to put a lock on the trigger. Basically, that speaks to accidents, you know. Uh, I mean, if you put, put a lock on the trigger so that nobody, the children can't grab it and fire it and so on, uh, yeah, that, that might make some sense for people uh, to think about when they have children in their, uh, in their homes and, and certainly people who have guns in their, in their homes and children or to be thinking carefully about safety issues and, and that's true of people who have swimming pools in their homes and have poisons and electrical appliances and so forth. Thankfully, it's not a huge problem uh, for us. Um, uh, people have talked about uh, one gun per month. No one should be able to buy more than one gun per month. And that's meant uh, to, to try to uh, interdict the black market. And they have this image, some people go out and they're buying a lot of guns and then they are selling them illegally on the street. If you could just get them to, to buy only one gun per month, that might, might put a, a crimp in the black market. I, I have no problem with that. But it's difficult to enforce, and you can have a lot of people, buy, you know, that they deputize to buy the one gun and so on. And you know, it, it doesn't seem like a very powerful, uh, a powerful solution. You could have waiting periods. Some people talk about waiting periods, and they have an image that that, that people uh, have a have a terrible argument, like here on the panel, and they go rushing off to a store. They buy the gun. They come rushing back and shoot somebody. That is very, very rare, extremely rare. You know, I mean, if you study homicide statistics and homicide uh, uh, homicide is a phenomenon. I mean, that I mean is is a very small, very, very small percentage of homicides, but maybe you could, uh, maybe you could do that. What, what you should think about is that where is policy going? You know, where are we going as a society? And the, uh, and the thing that might be disturbing to those uh, who, who, um, who think about uh, gun control is, is that the policy is going dramatically in the opposite direction. Uh, more guns and more more liberal policies about access to guns. So start with with the shall issue laws. I mean that's really quite remarkable in the last 20 years that so many states have passed laws uh, uh, saying that people have a have a uh, presumptive right to to a license as long as they have no criminal record to carry a concealed weapon, and that is that was passed in 40 states. I mean, it's sort of while the country slept, or while some, while, while the New York Times slept, or somebody slept, 40 states uh, have passed this. I mean, that is gun, that's where gun policy is going. Um, the, in 1994, you may remember that after a big political battle, Con your Congress passed an assault rifle ban, right? And President Clinton signed it as a major step towards uh, regaining peace on our streets and so forth. The ban had a 10-year sunset provision, so that it would be it would it would sunset in 10 years unless it was re reaffirmed. So in 2004, there were not 20 votes to reaffirm it right, in the U.S. Senate, and it died, and it sunsetted in 2004. You probably, some of you probably don't even know that. I mean, it, it had no political saliency at all. I mean, there was the Democratic Party, which had supported the, the uh, assault rifle ban in 1994, just abandoned the issue in 2004. So there's no political constituency to keep the assault rifle ban going. I mean, that could, in a way, take your breath away. I was not, not even any major spokespeople for it, not even, not even on the national agenda. Um, the, uh, a couple of years ago, your Congress uh, passed a law giving immunity from tort suits to gun manufacturers, right? No other industry, you know, has benefited from that kind of largesse. 
Uh, there had been various efforts to attack the, the gun problem by imposing liability on the manufacturers and a, and a federal law extending uh, immunity to all manufacturers was passed and signed. Um, subsequent to um, Hurricane Katrina, a bill was put before Congress to ban the confiscation of weapons during national emergencies like Katrina because the police had seized weapons during Katrina, and I think that passed through the Senate 96 to 4. So it's a, a prohibition on the government and on police seizing weapons during a period of national uh, uh, emergencies. After the, uh, the uh, massacre at Virginia State, people wrung their hands, well, how can we, how can we attack the gun problem more? Well, what can we do? The main response seems to be to arm the students uh, at, uh, at the university. The university now allows the students to carry weapons uh, on the university. And there is a big movement uh, uh, by uh, the gun uh, owners, uh, by the gun rights uh, people, to pass laws all over the country allowing students to be armed uh, on their campuses. So th that is where uh, the momentum is. And then if there uh, had to be any further momentum to, to point to, then we have the Heller versus District of Columbia, which for the first time uh, in our history, the Supreme Court rendered a decision uh, saying uh, more or less, we'll have to see how, how, uh, how they, how they in interpret it uh, in subsequent decisions, but that uh, the Constitution of the United States um, uh, guarantees American citizens individually uh, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, at least handguns in their homes. So uh, that is uh, that is where uh, where things stand. Well, I'm going to uh, approach this in, in a somewhat different way. I'm someone who comes from the, the world of uh, the interpretive humanities, uh, who a number of years ago got interested in issues of legal interpretation, and someone who's developed a, a, a sense of some uneasiness at some of the claims by legal actors about the grounding procedure and authoritativeness of their acts of interpretation which, unlike most of those uh, acts of interpretation made by literature professors, are actions in the real world. Um, think, for instance, of uh, the current debate over uh, John Hughes' torture memos and the actions that they uh, claim to legitimate. Um, in this case, um, I want to talk about the invalidation of the District of Columbia's gun control laws that uh, uh, Jim Jacobs was just uh, mentioning. That is, the Supreme Court's uh, overruling uh, a local attempt to, to, to regulate uh, a problem in, in urban crime violence, D.C. having, I believe, the highest homicide rate uh, in the country. Uh, so, uh, in D.C. versus Heller in June uh, 2008, um, the Supreme Court, a divided Supreme Court, um, uh, in an opinion written by Justice Scalia, uh, made the claim to be able to, to decide uh, this case uh, on an unambiguous uh, interpretation of the Second Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and Scalia goes about uh, his majority opinion with a relish uh, which suggests that he'd been waiting his whole life to tell us what this famously enigmatic uh, sentence really means. And indeed, uh, after a very brief recitation of the facts of the case, uh, Scalia, on the second page of his enormously long opinion, uh, begins, we turn first to the meaning of the Second Amendment. Uh, notice he doesn't say, the interpretation of or the possible meanings of, uh, not 
a, a, a construal or a reconstruction of the context of its reading and its understanding. No, he says, I'm going to tell you the meaning uh, of the Second Amendment. Uh, now, just recall for a moment uh, what that amendment uh, says and its, and its uh, interesting punctuation. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Now, one of the enigmas here has always been the relation of that introductory uh, phrase on the militia, a well-regulated uh, militia being necessary to the security of free state. The, 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 the relation between the introductory phrase on the militia to the right to, to keep and bear arms. Scalia solves that problem by calling uh, the initial um, phrase of the amendment a prefatory clause. And later on, prefatory clause in his language becomes prologue. Um, and the rest of the sentence he calls the operative clause. And then he goes on to argue, I think completely tendentiously, that the prefatory clause does not limit the operative clause. Um, uh, his, his, his definitions here are totally uh, circular. Once he's called the rest of the sentence the operative clause and, and uh, the, the first uh, uh, phrase, uh, prefatory or prologue, uh, it ceases to have any real uh, incidence uh, on the uh, sentence. I think here there is a hidden argument, um, in particular with a very interesting amicus uh, brief that was filed in DC versus Heller um, uh, on behalf of the professors of linguistics in English, um, which if you're interested in the case I recommend to you, which really uh, for me for the first time made sense of the syntax of the Second Amendment. Uh, the, the professors of linguistics point out that it is a Latinate construction. Uh, if you ever were subjected to high school Latin, it's what uh, is known as an ablative absolute. Uh, an ablative absolute is a construction that we find faulty in current uh, English because we consider it a kind of dangling modifier. Um, and, but in, in, in Latin, an ablative absolute uh, was a perfectly fine construction and always had to be translated as if the ablative absolute modified not a single noun, um, but the whole uh, succeeding uh, clause, um, which is why it's called absolute. Um, and so you should translate it uh, with a because. Uh, it has a causal uh, effect because of well-regulated uh, militia. Um, if this makes the right to keep and bear arms uh, uh, a logical entailment of the need for a well-regulated uh, uh, militia. And this is the argument that Stevens tries to make in his uh, dissent. Now, Scalia will have, have nothing uh, to do with the, uh, the brief for professors of linguistics. He cites it uh, to contradict it. Um, he says that uh, his notion of uh, constitutional interpretation, quote, excludes secret or technical meanings that would have not have been known to ordinary citizens in the founding generation. Uh, well, what does he mean by ordinary citizens? Um, that sounds very democratic, right? But in fact, I think you could argue that any educated person in the 18th century would have been brought up on Latin rhetoric. That's what schooling uh, was. You didn't study English literature, you studied Latin. Uh, and therefore, the ablative absolute uh, construction was something that was truly ingrained in you. It also, they also go on to have very interesting comments on, on the very punctuation of the Second Amendment, which is an oral punctuation based as 18th century punctuation was on, on sort of breathing marks um, uh, rather than on the, the logic that we want uh, now. So I would say that Scalia's opinion in D.C. versus Heller unfolds as a kind of series of philological coup d'etat. Uh, he pulls out uh, of other constitutional clauses the inference that the right involved in the Second Amendment is, quote, unambiguously individual rather than collective. Then a few pages later, it has become, quote, the individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. 
where, where he finds the notion of confrontation uh, in the Bill of Rights is not at all clear to me. Then a few pages after that, the Second Amendment becomes uh, about, the, about individual uh, self-defense. In fact, he calls individual self-defense the central component of the right itself, to which I just say, huh? Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is pulling uh, uh, in, in interpretations out of nothing. And finally, towards the end of his opinion, the Second Amendment right comes to be about, quote, the inherent right to self-defense. Um, so that's what the Second Amendment, uh, for all its talk of, of militias, is really about, the inherent right to self-defense, as if there were some incarnation of, of natural law. Now, let me just say that I, what, I'm, what I have to say here about DC versus uh, Heller, though it may go at it in a slightly different uh, way, uh, is by no means uh, original. Uh, there's been a lot of, of uh, criticism of his interpretive moves in Heller, and most notably uh, from uh, jurists and professors uh, uh, of a generally conservative uh, bent. Um, J. Harvey Wilkinson um, has posted a long article to be uh, published in the Virginia Law Review um, in which he says, for instance, quote, the Constitution's text at least has as little to say about restrictions on firearm ownership by felons as it does about the trimesters of pregnancy. So for, uh, this is the, the ultimate insult, right, uh, from someone on, on the right, um, comparing D.C. versus Heller uh, to Roe versus Wade. And indeed, that's the, the central uh, thrust of, of uh, Wilkinson's uh, art, uh, argument, that this is going to become uh, the Roe versus Wade uh, of the right, that it's equally ungrounded and equally an act of judicial overreaching and uh, the overthrow of uh, local authority uh, on a very important social issue. Uh, Richard Posner also wrote a, a scathing article in the New Republic uh, uh, criticizing uh, Scalia's uh, logic. So the, the, the final point uh, that I want to make up uh, about all of this, and this has to do, of course, much more with process than with the substance of the problem of guns, um, the decision, uh, uh, the opinion, uh, not only Scalia's opinion, but actually uh, Stevens' dissent, um, uh, is argued in the context of, uh, of an originalist and textualist uh, act of interpretation. Posner, in his New Republic piece, refers to Scalia's originalism as faux originalism, uh, which I think is a good way to describe it, actually, because it really has nothing to do uh, with the, uh, the 18th century context of, uh, of interpretation. I would add that it's also faux textual interpretation. Um, as, uh, for instance, John Hughes' torture memos are also a uh, faux textual interpretation. That, by that I mean they are seeming close readings of texts that really ignore plain meanings and rules of syntax. They are, they are acts of interpretation that claim to derive everything from text but have no real principles for doing so. At least the amicus uh, brief from the professors of linguistics had a method, whether you agree with its conclusions or not. I think ultimately uh, Scalia uh, reveals himself to be methodless uh, and to offer not authority but pure authoritarianism. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the speakers for speaking not only well, but exactly 15 minutes each. And is, in my experience, very unusual. So I'm very grateful because it does give us uh, about 25 minutes of time uh, for questions. I think it's important that we do that. Normally, I like to see if there's a student question first. And I'll recognize a student if I see one. Right exists, that's the motivator. And 
When people are surveyed as to why they have firearms, uh, the, the uh, number one answer is for self-defense, and uh, then the number two answer is for recreation. More people uh, claim to have firearms for uh, recreational target shooting than play tennis in the United States. Um, so I, I don't think that it's, I, I don't think it's a, um, a, a prevalent answer that I, I have a gun because uh, the Constitution says I, I have a right to. People do have reasons. But like you, I was struck by the number of people uh, who claim to have guns because this was uh, a basic American right. And it, they present it almost as an act of patriotism. And I do think this is one of the ways that the NRA transformed the debate, that not only should gun ownership be, be legal, uh, it should be an act of Americanism, which showed that you were ready to resist any uh, illegitimate claims to take away your rights. What that would mean in practice, other than sort of crazy survivalists in the hills of Wyoming, I don't know. Uh, let me add two things. Um, Part of what you're getting at is, is the symbolism. I, I'm not sure that this is rooted in anything that uh, um, the NRA started. Um, if you think about Dred Scott, for example, where uh, one of uh, Taney's cr uh, criticisms was, oh my goodness, if you, we uh, gave these people the rights of citizens, uh, they would be, well, they'd enjoy the right to arms that the rest of us folks enjoy. Uh, th there are a number of, of treatments of, of, of that theme. You know, this, is, this is way before uh, the NRA. Um, the, the other thing that I'd suggest about the, the sort of political value of uh, the, the firearm, uh, certainly it's, it's a quaint notion that, that uh, you know, Bubba with his uh, shotgun is, is going to stand up against the, the tanks when the, the whoever rolls in. Um, and, and, and that is true technologically. That is, we've uh, evolved to the point where the, there is an extraordinary imbalance between the kind of technology that the state has versus the kind of technology that, that can be employed by, by private actors. Um, so, so yes, it is true that, that people in some sort of conventional conflict with the state could not prevail. But it, it seems to me that there's also a, a political question, and that on, on the political issue, um, having an, an armed society uh, presents for a, a malevolent state very, very high political costs. Uh, I'll give you two examples. So both are politically unpopular folks, but they were costly measures for the state. Waco and Ruby Ridge. So to the degree that you're ever worried as a political outsider about majoritarian theory or however you want to talk about it, uh, take Waco or Ruby Ridge and multiply it by 100 or multiply it by 1,000. That's an extraordinary political cost for the, 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 the state to incur to put down just a few knuckleheads. Now, it has this externality that you're worried about because if the knuckleheads are pursuing ends that we worry about, then you've got basically that gun dilemma that we always have, that is, these things can be used for good or ill. You know, I, I was struck by that, that too, and one of the virtues of this book, I think, is that Kyle has got wonderful quotations from these people. Just notice one of them myself, it's a Missouri photograph, in which the, one of the subjects says, the Second Amendment isn't about duck hunting, it's about owning firearms that are serious enough to keep the government honest. And that's the point that, that Nicholas is making, I think. And so it's, it goes beyond, I think, the kind of NRA rhetoric, and it feeds into a, a kind of rhetoric that's much bigger than that. And I think that Nicholas is suggesting. We heard a lot more about, I think, when militias were much more in the news. But it's, it's really very important. I wondered, by the way, just irrelevantly here, whether you found when you took these photographs, it seemed to me there was some relationship between gun owning and dog owning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs>
Okay, is there another student question? Yeah. I wanted to ask about uh, the regulation of, of guns currently and um, what effect that has on the Regulation of the of firearms. Yeah, firearms. Yeah. Um, you know, I, what is the problem? Again, I think the problem is is that uh, there are uh, uh, too many uh, people who uh, who would who are willing to commit violent crime uh, in in the country, and most of them are ineligible to buy a gun or to to possess a gun, uh, and it's mostly uh, an enforcement, uh, it's an enforcement issue, and uh, people uh, violate the laws. So they violate the tax laws, and they violate uh, the securities laws, and, uh, you know, we can't, we, we can't get it down to uh, zero. It, it's, I, I, I think the, the drug uh, analogy is a good one. Another one I like to use is, is automobiles. Uh, in traffic accidents, we absorb 40,000 deaths a year in the United States. Uh, it doesn't cause any discussions, any panels, any courses, any departments. Uh, it's, it's what we pay uh, for the privilege of having such a, a convenient transportation system. Uh, and I could ask you, I mean, is there something wrong with the regulation of our traffic system that that takes the toll of 40,000 lives a year or have we got that pretty well right <laughs> focused on was uh, quite clearly that the militia was the body of the people bearing their own private arms showing up when they were called. And we see the, the um, further to this, we see in, in Heller basically Scalia saying, well, the whole notion is that the right is uh, uh, guaranteed to the people from whom the militia uh, may be drawn. So the militia is a much smaller entity than the people broadly. The other textual piece that, that we didn't talk about yet is you not only have to read the um, Heller opinion and the Second Amendment in the context of just the language of the Second Amendment, you have to read it in the context of the broader Constitution. So if you go to Article I, Section 8 of the original Constitution, there is all of this talk about the militia and the militia power. And what you can see is that the federal government has essentially plenary power over the operation of calling out, et cetera, of, of the militia. So if, if Stevens is right, that is, if this was just a, a, an attempt to give states rights to their militia, then it was an implicit repeal of Article I, Section 8. And I'm, I mean, this, this repealer argument is something people have talked about for a long time and said, well, if you take the state's rights view seriously, then that's what it means. The other thing that happens if you take the state's rights view seriously is that it doesn't generate the kind of violent policy results that people are pining for. That is, in the 44 states that I mentioned that have private, that have their own separate constitutional provisions, the analysis is simply this. Okay, the Second Amendment means that the state has a right to administer its militia how it wants. And these states have already decided that they want their individual citizens to have the right to arms. So the state's rights Second Amendment really only has violence policy implications for those six or so, and actually 
eight because two of those 44 state constitutions have, have been interpreted in a way that weakens them. Uh, so in, in 42 states at least, the state's rights constitution still generates an individual right to arms. Peter, I, I, I would give a slightly different answer. I, I think that it's clear that the, the Second Amendment responded to a fear of local militias uh, being disarmed by uh, by a federal government, uh, and it goes back to the fear of the colonial militias being disarmed by the, by the king. Uh, so the more you analyze it out, yes, probably, though there's been different uh, historical readings of this, probably these guns were muskets, were held at home rather than an armory, uh, because uh, they could not be very well maintained unless you kept them at home. But if you then try to analogize it to the, to, to the present condition, what is taking the place of the militia? Well, the National Guard. But the National Guard is not really a militia, and it can be nationalized in times of emergency. So what you come up with is that the situation referred to by the Second Amendment just is That's not extant anymore. And the whole thing is an anachronism, and trying to parse it out to come up with a 21st century right makes no sense. I, let, me, <clears throat> let me comment on just very briefly, too, because um, I would say that the larger context is not the Constitution, but uh, life in America in the late 18th century in the way that Peter just talked about it. And I want to say, rather than take a position on it, that there is a rich body of historical scholarship uh, on it, and it's worth looking at if you're interested in this question. The book I mentioned that was so controversial was written by a man named Michael Bellil, and I say, well, what's wrong with it is the statistics. Uh, but there's a lot of other information in it that is textual and is not, uh, is quite reliable, I think. And more recently, there's a book by uh, Saul Cornell called A Well-Regulated Militia, The Founding Fathers and the Origins of Gun Control in America. And there are others uh, on this. So that for anybody who's seriously interested, the historians really do have something to say uh, about this problem. Okay. I, I just wanted to, well, just about this Belial book, I'm just surprised that you mentioned that because, you know, there was uh, an investigation of, of his work and, and a finding of his university that he made up his data, that it, there was no such data. He was uh, removed from his university. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's excoriated among, among academicians in the United States, and, it, you know, it just seems funny to you know, to hold that up. I mean, there are other works, but I mean, that has been totally, utterly, fully repudiated. Well, we should talk about it later, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I was the chair of the committee that investigated the book for Emory University. <laughs> <laughs> and what was wrong is, is the statistics. In fact, a very small part of the book is statistical. They're, they're long narrative portions. The point I wanted to make, though, is that there is a rich historical investigation of all this, and I would urge you to put it in a, a bigger context. All the way in the back. Uh, the question, is there a constitutional right to handguns, is in a way answered by the ECB government. The debates still unfold about the And I want to pose a question to you. Would it be possible to outlaw handguns with their overwhelming dominance in violence, crime statistics, in, in a way that machine guns were outlawed in the 1930s? Um, or would the self-defense argument win over there? Um, you know, I can imagine, even though there's no militia today, someone would be a little more effective showing up with a machine gun than the 9 year old Jim? Well, I just say that, you know, there's 100 million uh, uh, handguns in, in private circulation today, and uh, if somebody federally, uh, some congressman or senator, they, they, and they introduced a bill to prohibit uh, handguns, uh, the first thing that would happen would be there would be an incredible uh, run on the sale of handguns in the in the in the period in which there was debate about this bill. Um, you know, it took the Brady law to, to pass the Brady law took seven years, um, and and of course a Democratic House, Democratic Senate, and Democratic. Uh, presidency, uh, I mean, a, a complete ban on handguns, let's say, would take five years or more. I, by that time, we probably would have doubled or tripled the number of handguns. Then you'd have to figure out how to, uh, uh, how to enforce the law, and you would then be like uh, prohibition. 
You know, you would have to decide how, you know, how many people you want to arrest and what kind of punishments. So you would have to decide whether, um, what would happen if, if there were jury trials. I mean, in parts of this country, uh, it, it's hard to imagine that you could get a unanimous jury to convict a, a person for uh, 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 possessing a, a handgun. Uh, you know, I, I think I think prosecutors wouldn't prosecute and uh, juries wouldn't convict. And, uh, you know, it, it's just I, I just think that this is a fantasy. I mean, we are who we are and we are an armed uh, uh, an armed society. And, uh, you know, uh, face, I, I mean, people have to face it and think about, you know, uh, uh, where we go from here. What are the realities of this situation? I, you know, we ought to we ought to be thinking about how do you stop uh, people from getting their hands on explosives and plastic explosives and uh, and stuff like that. The, the gun issue is over. The other thing I would, I would suggest just as a supplement to what uh, Jim indicated is that one of the things that's implicit in your question is what's the path of the illicit firearm from this sort of gray market now, that is these people who are holding the firearms in defiance, to the, the full black market, the people that maybe you're more worried about. And you, you can quibble with the distinction between, you know, where there is a difference between gray and black. But the, 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 the transfer mechanism then is the 500 million, or sorry, 500,000 uh, thefts per year that we uh, talked about or stipulated at the beginning. It's actually more than that, depending on who you talk to. Uh, but if you, if you imagine confiscation uh, or prohibition and, and then a confiscation scheme um, debated and implemented tomorrow, well, there are lots of firearms that, of, of which there is no record. And the question is, how many of those will be held in defiance? My sense of it is that uh, lots of them would be held in defiance. And then the question is, are those people worrisome people, or, or are they more like the people in this book, if you assume that they are moderately trustworthy? How do the guns get from them to the people you're really worried about? It's through the, th the thefts, and, and that's, it's an awful lot of, of firearms still tr moving into to the black market, even under a period of confiscation. I, I, to me, the key to it, it was in, in, in it, when you mentioned that there would be parts of the country where juries would not convict, there would be parts of the country where they would also. And that's what uh, I find so appalling about DC versus Heller is it's taking what seems like a fairly reasonable approach, not to handgun prohibition, but to control in a crime ridden urban area and overruling it in. Uh, on the basis of some claim to a national uh, right to, to self-defense. So I think, no, you're not going to ban handguns at this point. It's too late. Um, uh, but I think that high crime urban areas should certainly be free to try and work out reasonable controls. And I think the notion that we have to arm everyone, uh, University of Texas apparently now considering yeah. this option, arming every student uh, presumably every faculty member as well, if we can learn to shoot straight um, on, on campus, just, uh, it's just absurd. I mean, it really is a sign of a society gone mad. And uh, one, I, 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 I know the 300 million figure, I know that it is too late to, uh, to abolish, but one has to at least say, we're gonna try and roll this back and not, not give in to uh, the latest uh, wave of hysteria from the NRA. Comments. The first comment is uh, the issue has been framed as a legal issue, not a moral issue. And my second comment is to explain why it's supposed to be only framed as a legal issue, not a moral issue. You cannot frame the gun control or ownership in terms of as a moral issue unless you have a clear philosophy <coughs> of war because there are connections, both are weapons. One is a Using here, individual killing individual and others, so one nation is willing to kill another nation. Now, what is our understanding of war? Our understanding of war, we were taught in this very university and many others, from Plato to Kant, war is to be praised. So I think Professor Jacobs is right. We are what we are because we wage war on others and our will. I think that's one of the questions, or we'll go on to a question. Yes, please. Well, I guess another way to look at this, we haven't talked about looking at it from a public health perspective. And um, I mean, there are institutes, you know, like Penn and at Johns Hopkins that, that look at, you know, how can we cut down on deaths from firearm injuries in emergency rooms? And I think we need to look more at this as a society and think about how can we do better to prevent and 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 prevent
to get them and being more tuned into the all of us walking among each other who are unstable and depressed and have very easy access. There is no turning back. We're, the, our society is flooded. We are in our society. But I think that that gets back to this gentleman's comment about you know the moral issues and can't we think a little bit more like that and we all have to be kind of wrapping ourselves in armor and ready to do battle. They, they, other countries have tried it. Uh, New Zealand tried it and, uh, for a number of years and finally gave up and just abandoned it. Uh, Canada now is involved in a big uh, registration of guns and uh, uh, they're having some problems with it and it's very costly and so forth. Uh, it, you know, if we had a registration uh, program in the United States, um, it, 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 there would be a lot of resistance to it. Uh, when we tried to register assault rifles, uh, we only got about 5 to 10 percent compliance. Uh, a lot of gun owners would, would never register their guns for fear that the next, uh, the next uh, massacre uh, there would be a proposal to take away their guns. They're very paranoid about that. But even if we got them all registered, uh, what would we what would we have achieved? Let's say we had all the guns registered uh, and we had a massive gun. What? I, I ha you know, I mean, I, what I do, and uh, I, I suppose you, you could say, well, if you found a gun at a, at a crime scene, you, you'd have a good uh, beginning for an investigation. You could trace it back to who it was registered to. Uh, but there'd be a lot of guns that uh, weren't registered. You know, the criminals would have would would, would have unregistered uh, guns. There'd be a lot of stolen guns. Um, and you know, you know, we register our cars, and uh, it's it's easier to you know to find cars that aren't registered and they're out there in the public. But you know, our our regulation of of automobiles is not an ideal uh, system. We have you know people talk to me a lot about that and they say, look what we've done with cars. We license the drivers and we register the things. We have insurance requirements. Hundreds of thousands of people drive without licenses. Right, hundreds of thousands of people drive without insurance. You know, we, we I mean, it, it's massive. You know, in New York State, where they arrest somebody who has no license, which is very common, they assign him a dummy license number, and then they revoke the number. <laughs> also, the the practical the practical violence policy is well. If you were a criminal and somehow or another you also had a registered gun, which presumes something that's not supposed to happen, the manner in which the firearm is registered is simply through the serial number that one way or another for different types of, of guns is uh, stamped someplace on the firearm, but not for all firearms. So, so guns that were sold prior to uh, uh, 1968 and then guns that were sold earlier, uh, many of them were, were never registered in accordance with the serial number. Some of them don't have, some guns actually do not have serial numbers, and those that do, uh, the obliteration of the serial number is just the, the sort of standard criminal uh, uh, precursor to utilizing the fire. It's a Dremel tool or it's a file and it takes about three minutes. We have time for one more question. Just a simple one. You alluded to New Zealand, Canada. Is there any modern society that has prohibition on handguns? And if so, has that gone? Well, a lot of countries prohibit handguns. And some of them, uh, their prohibitions are effective, and some of them, uh, uh, nobody pays attention to it. But, uh, J you know, Japan uh, uh, prohibits uh, handguns, and they're very, very, and guns. And they're very few guns in circulation in Japan, although they're organized crime guys all have guns, and the police recognize that. But there's no culture of guns. China doesn't allow uh, its population to have guns, and uh, they don't see guns as any kind of a problem there. Uh, so there are, there are many countries uh, in which uh, 
in, in which uh, there's no gun culture. This was an amazing experiment in the United States that's still going on of arming an entire, you know, of, of, of the, that a people could be armed. Uh, you know, very few countries have embarked on that policy. You have some other countries where they, they ban guns, uh, but uh, th there's so much violation of the rules that, uh, a, that a, a very high number of people are armed. Okay. Can I, final comment? Uh, well, just to supplement the, the response, the other thing that you find in, uh, in the UK, at least over the last uh, 10 years, where uh, in response to, for example, the Dunblane massacre and, and, and others, the, the British have uh, tightened what were already relatively more stringent regulations that we have uh, in the US, is uh, that their gun crime rate has escalated. And the suggestion is that the cause of it is the, the importation of contraband firearms that are more powerful or, or exhibit more firepower power than the ones that were in the domestic civilian stock before uh, the handgun regulations were, were, were tightened. So the, the concept, the worry about the cheating uh, in response to uh, uh, gun confiscation or registration is, is, is a serious one that you, you, you've got to engage. Okay. Well, I, for, I forgot to ask you, tell you at the beginning of the session, you should turn off your cell phones. <laughs> so we, we made it. I want to uh, both uh, thank the, the panelists before I do, though, to remind you that we will have a reception uh, downstairs in the Bernstein Gallery and that the photographer will be there. Uh, you can get there by going across the atrium and downstairs on either side. But can I thank the panel for a wonderful discussion?